Okay, so welcome back. So uh, today I'm going to give a quick review of what we talked about last time on the quantum data compression. And then I'm really entering the week 10's topic, which I use the title, No Clones in Quantum. Okay, so this is the one slide review of what we talked about last time. So this is related to the coding theorem, noiseless regime, where a source is emitting uh, IID information uh, messages and with some entropy rate, H of X for the classical case. But the quantum case is emitting quantum states uh, with the entropy rate, the S polynomial entropy as a row. Row is the reduced or the ensemble describing the source. Okay, so the theorems are very similar. So if the if you want to encode uh, with rate, which is larger than the entropy, then there exists a, a scheme that is reliable. Uh, but if if you try to encode with a ray less than the corresponding entropy, then uh, any compression scheme that you use will not be reliable. So that's, these are the contents of the two respective classical and quantum noiseless channel channel coding theorem. So any question on this? So the connection between the two is uh, through these four points. So to generate to quantum, you use uh, alphabet that is drawn from quantum states. So this source is replaced by an ensemble and the notion of typical sequence is generated to typical subspace. The entropy Shannon's is replaced by four Neumanns. So that's that's the noiseless channel uh, channel coding theorem. And there's also a case where if the channel is noisy, so assuming you have a message X and you go through some channel N, you output some Y. And you can talk about the capacity that uh, the message that you can encode uh, by sending through the, the noisy channel. But I don't think I will be discussing these in detail. And I will refer you to these two theorems. Uh, I think this will be covered maybe in next semester's quantum computing course by Professor Koratin. But for uh, the purpose of this core, this, this these will be advanced topics, so I will not discuss them. Okay, so, but I want to go to the main topic of today about uh, implication of no cloning of quantum states. Okay, so let me start with the content of no cloning. Okay, the statement's really easy to understand. So let's take, for example, if you have a, a pure state alpha and you have some state, let me just call it blank, just like a paper, you want to make copies. So you want to make copy of the quantum state alpha into let's say in this case, additional copy alpha. Uh, it turns out this is not possible. It was shown a long time ago by these gentlemen there, uh, except certain states. So for example, if states are classical uh, computational state, then you can make copies. Okay, so we're going to uh, see a simple proof of this by using contradiction. So let's assume it is possible that these processes can be made uh, by unitary transformation to copy alpha state you end up with two copies, you copy the beta state, and end up with two copies. Um, but because this is unitary 
operation. So if you take into account account of all ancillary ancillary qubit that you use and treat that as a unitary process, then this says the initial and final must preserve the overlap. So initial overlap is determined by that of alpha and beta. That's the initial overlap. The final, you have two copies. So essentially you square that overlap. So really just algebra by canceling out one factor or you could infer that alpha, the overlap is either zero or, or one. So it's either orthogonal or the identical, okay? So uh, the certain state that you can copy are these computational states. You can copy these. Th this is fine, but cannot you cannot copy. If you are chosen the basis that you can copy these two basis say then you cannot copy this. Okay. So that's the essence of the no cloning theorem. And what is the consequence? So one consequence is that if you can clone, then you can distinguish not orthogonal state, right? So we, we know that uh, orthogonal state, you can uh, you need to uh, distinguish between two of them. But if a state is non-orthogonal, then you cannot make such a uh, unanimous claim. But if you could clone non-orthogonal state, then you could make enough copies of alpha and beta. Suppose initially they are not orthogonal, then you make many copies. So by making many copies, the overlap, if you have n copy, it raised to n power. That means uh, the overlap, which is less than one, absolute value less than one to begin with, would sort of decay exponentially as you have more copies. So that means you could choose a very large n. If you can make copies, you just copy, uh, make many copies so that the overlap of the set of, two set of many copies approach to very small. That means they are almost orthogonal. So if they're orthogonal, you could find uh, a basis that allow you to make measurement to distinguish the two states. So that's one consequence. Any question? Okay, so this is uh, conceptually simple once we accept that the no cloning is not allowed and the proof is also very elementary. So we know that non-orthogonal state cannot be distinguished in a deterministic way. So uh, uh, as shown here, if I have a state psi one and another state psi two. So how do I distinguish them? So if I cannot distinguish them with 100%, maybe I could just try to achieve some maximal discrimination, right? Um, but if you could, so on the other hand, if you could uh, uniquely determine these two, then you could use that if there's a some black box, some machine that allow you to distinguish uh, non-orthogonal state, you could use that box to perform cloning of non-orthogonal state. Yeah, so, so the argument is as follow because the, suppose we're given the two state, they are not orthogonal, we know their description, but we don't know which one is, is which. If you could determine, determine you need me which one, then you could then, if I know it's psi one, then I could produce as many copies because I know the description. So I can make many copies. And if I'm, if I know it's psi two, then I just uh, produce as many as possible. So that's one, so the, the two sides of the no cloning 
uh, and uh, state discrimination. So I guess, so, so that's the relation between the two. No cloning and now orthogonal and discrimination. Meaning that it's not going to be deterministic. Okay. Okay, so yeah, this was the question that posed earlier. So if we cannot do perfect state discrimination, so what can we do? So I'm going to just illustrate the idea using simple example. So as I shown the two state, I'm going to just choose this one to be zero, just consider the qubits. And the other one just assign some coefficient in front of zero cosine and the coefficient from one is sine theta. Okay, I'm just limiting the theta to be zero and power over two. So, so the coefficient are not negative. Okay, just for simplicity. Okay, so that's the setup. Suppose I, I'm given these two states and I know these are the two that I'm given and I'm also assuming that I'm equally uh, given this. So the probability of getting one is the same as the other. So the question that I like to ask, what is the best strategy that I can distinguish the two states? Okay. But it turns out this question uh, need to be cl clarified a little bit more. And there are two ways to do that, at least two. One, the first one is I want to maximize the overall success of distinguish one or distinguish two or this is also called minimum error, this is this scenario. The second one uh, that will be discussed later is to maximize the unambiguous discrimination. So let's say uh, you, want to, you want to know if I'm given, say it really is one or two, but sometimes you will say, okay, I don't know. But let's discuss the first case, uh, minimum error scenario. Okay, that's the case one. So to do that, uh, we're going to find a basis. So a basis uh, to do this measurement in a sense of block sphere, I have two ND, uh, two poles on the opposite of each other. So one is chosen to be uh, V1, the other is chosen to be V2. And in terms of block sphere, uh, they are in some opposite direction. Okay, it could be, i just label V1 here, V2 here. But in terms of this geometry with, with, uh, with angles, they are really uh, 90 degree, representing that they are orthogonal. Okay, so what I want to do is that I want to make a two outcome measurement if it's projected to V1 or the detector P1 click, then I say, okay, I declare that the state is psi one. If V2 click, then I declare that the state is psi two. Okay, so that's the strategy. Okay, then I can define a probability of success. So if uh, there's a probability, okay, 50%, I'm given psi one, and if V1 click, that's the, and that's the probability of V1 click, that's the overlap between the two, the square of overlap. This is the probability um, given psi one and I detect psi, uh, V1. The second term is the probability um, I'm given psi two. So given this and I detect, detect V2. Okay, so the one half is the probability that I'm given each state. So this is really simple algebra, the overlap V1 and uh, psi one is really just the cosine square. The second one 
V2 and Psi2, basically just the inner product of the two. And this is the sine square of the difference of the two angle. Okay. Then what I really want is I want to max maximize. I want to maximize this probability respect to the, the angle. So basically I'm trying to I'm trying to rotate this basis so that uh, I'm going to get the maximum probability. And this is really elementary algebra. You could use a uh, trigonometry and you find that the maximum angle pi happen to be the negative of pi over two minus theta and divided by two. And you could also plug in the this and find the maximum probability is related to uh, one plus psi theta over two. Okay, so we can check, for example, if theta is pi over two, meaning they're orthogonal. So that means uh, the probability of distinguish which one is which is a, a unity, right? So that, that's what we, we know that orthogonal state, right? we should be able to distinguish them. Okay, any question on this part? Okay, if not, uh, I'm going to give a sort of intuitive physical picture of, of this. In fact, this is very easy to understand. So first, the angle is negative because I'm, I'm measuring here. So negative meaning that this angle is, is here. Right? So V1 is here with angle pi over two minus theta and divided by two. And V2 is, is here. Okay, and they have to be orthogonal. So V2 is in this direction. And this angle is the same. Okay. So the physical picture, so I'm just uh, rewriting everything, all the same information, just copy from the previous slide. But except I just say the minimum error is one minus the maximum success probability. It's one minus the sine angle then divided by two over two. Okay, so the physical meaning is this. So I have to make a choice of orthogonal measurement. So what I would like to do is this one should have the maximum overlap. This one should have at maximum overlap with V2 and I have to adjust. So in this case, because the probability is equal, so I have given psi one, psi two equally. So I I'm going to choose an equal angle here. So this is fine. Let me just use absolute value, fine. Okay, so that's the meaning. So yeah. So uh, in general, if you have different weight of different distribution of getting psi one or psi two, this minimum error is uh, rated by this bound. Okay, but we could also, this is a whole uh, code for, this is called Hellstrom bound. We could check when, uh, when P1 equal to P2 equal to one half. In this case, that factor is just one, right? So in that case, this is equal to one half, one minus, one minus the overlap square. Okay, so the, uh, I think I want to minimize the error. So the minimal error is related to the overlap. So that's a natural because the only thing is the relative angle or the overlap between the two states. Okay. And that reduced to this. This is cosine square, right? So that reduced to that. Okay, any question on this?
Okay. So uh, this case one is minimum error or maximum probability, maximum success probability. The second one, but okay, maybe I want to make comment uh, on this. They are not unambiguous, right? Because um, this one has large uh, probability projecting to that, but also has some probability projecting to V2, right? So even if I get a click of V1, I might get contribution of psi2 projected to V1. So therefore, this is not a unambiguous. So even if you get a click V1, you cannot say, okay, it must be psi1. Okay. So uh, the second way of defining the problem is, I really want to know that when uh, it's psi one, it has to be psi one. When when the indicator says one, I, I want to know for sure that it's psi one, it cannot be psi two. So on the other hand, if a detector corresponding to two clicks, uh, that I need to know that it's, it's for sure it comes from psi two, it does not come from psi one. Okay, that's the second scenario. I, but in this case, I allow that there are cases uh, I have to declare I don't know. So that's so that's so there are three cases when detector one click it it must be one. Detector two click it must be two. And I'm going to attribute the case of I don't know the answer or ambiguous to like detector three. So I'm going to Describe using three operator, right? So for example, just to comparison, when we say measurement in zero and one, we basically we basically said there are projectors corresponding to the measurement, right? And these two projectors need to be added up to an identity, okay? So how do I write down the M1, M2, such that I have this feature? Okay. In this particular case, it's, it's not that difficult because there are only two cases, right? So I can draw a, a vector that's per, perpendicular to psi one. I label as psi one perf because it's orthogonal to psi one if I try to make projection into psi one perf, the contribution from psi one is zero, right? So suppose there's a detector indicating this detector. So its implication is that if this one clicks, that must be psi two. So I, let me label this as detector two. And I could draw a vector side two per perpendicular side two. So if this detector click, if this one click or yeah, when, when I get this detection signature, it must come from side one, right? It cannot come from two because the state two is orthogonal to that, has no projection. So I label this as detector one, M1, this one, detector two, label with M2. So they are almost projectors. So as I wrote here, so M1 would be projector to, as I indicated here, psi2 perpendicular, but I allow some overall coefficient. And similarly, M2 is a proportional to projector to onto psi1 perpendicular. And I also allow some proportional constant. Okay, so because I'm given these to stay with equal probability, so I can choose the same coefficient c. Um, but there are cases that I have to declare that I don't know. So the overall probability is one as indicated by the sum of the back, uh, prop operator to be identity. So therefore the I don't know case 
is really the identity minus the the two cases that I know, right? So so this set uh, of measurement description is called generalized measurement. Okay, let me not define it too mathematical, but basically these has to be a mission operator non-negative and some of them has to be uh, just the identity. So identity meaning the the probability is concerned. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, quick question. Yeah. So does the construction of M1 and M2 require us to know what the classical representation of Psi1 and Psi2 are? Yeah, so we need to know what the two state we're given. Okay. Is that the question? Yes, yes. Yeah, we need to know the description. So if you were giving, given me arbitrary state, I have no way okay. of knowing the description. It's like finding needle in C. <laughs> I don't know how to. Okay. Yeah, I need to have some prior knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so I write down M3 here. So M3 is identity minus the M1. I just write, okay, so I did not explicitly write down what uh, side one perp is, but this is easy, right? Side one is zero, so side one perp is one, right? And side two is the cosine times zero state plus side times one state. So the side two perp, it's easy to just uh, write down it orthogonal one. Okay, uh, which we use that in previous case, but um, we use that in the context of measurement, right? So the, if this is one of the basis D1 state, then it's orthogonal is this one. It's basically the coefficient are related by rotation. These are related by rotation, okay? Okay, so I'm writing down are the projectors, right? This is the projector. And I have M3. So, and the success probability is uh, there is a probability one half. I'm given a state one, right? And uh, if detector M1 click, that means it's successful. So, this is successfully detect one. Okay, and this is the probability of detecting detecting two. Okay. And of course when three clicks, then we don't know. So we don't add that into our success probability. Okay. Yeah, so basically uh, if I want to say a little more of the generalized measurement is that the probability is really just trace of the state. This is input state. And this is the measurement operator. Okay. But uh, in this case, the it's almost projector. So when we, we know when it's projector, it's really just uh, overlap like this, okay. So for example, a projector like that. Let me just, for example, like this. Right? If it's projector to be zero, then that's just the overlay of two. So, and that uh, is exactly what I see here, except there's this overall C coefficient, right? So this is a probability that if I'm given psi one, which is zero, that I detect that using the M1 operator. The okay, M1 operator is constructed to be, the M1 operator is constructed to be the orthogonal state projector to, to, to two. 
Okay. And this one is the probability that I'm getting, getting the two. Okay. So uh, really, this is a simple algebra. So this is psi square. And this one here is also sine square. So two copies of sine square uh, that give me C times sine square. But I want to maximize. I want to maximize this success probability. I want, want to maximize respect to a parameter. In this case, is C, right, C. But there is a constraint that C is related to M3. It has to be greater than, so non-negative. Okay, so that's in the next page. Yeah, so I, I copy all the uh, required information here. This is what we've seen, the M3. And I can write in terms of matrix form. And you've seen how you turn that into a matrix form also in the Adiabatic quantum computation for Grover algorithm. Okay, so basically you just take this projector, right? So it's easy to see. This is sine square in this corner here, cosine square in this corner, and there's an additional one from here, and cross turn are sine and cosine for the minus. Okay, so this identity minus c times this matrix. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, poly matrices, you would like to write as identity minus C times there is an identity inside here because sine square is one minus cosine square. So you check out identity. And this is this is a poly sigma Z, right? With the coefficient minus cosine square. And the off diagonal element is sigma X. Okay, if you still don't feel comfortable with poly matrices, you could just diagonalize. And you find, at least for this part involving poly matrices, the eigenvalues are plus minus cosine. So I just remind you this eigenvalues for such, uh, such a form, R is a vector, is really just a the length of the, the vector plus and minus sign. Okay, so this means that this means that one minus c one plus minus cosine has to be non-negative because these are eigenvalue of m3. Okay, the worst case scenario comes from the plus case. So that means the maximum c is constrained to be one divided by this coefficient one plus cosine okay so if if c is this then that's the maximum i can get okay okay so far yeah this is algebra so then i can just plug into the the maximum probability i've already found that this is that so if i put in c yeah sorry if i put in c to be one over one plus cosine and sine square is one. If I rewrite one minus cosine square, then you divided that because this is one minus cosine, one plus cosine. So you divided the plus one plus, you are left with one minus. And the cosine is actually the overlap between the two states. So I, I just write one minus the as a rule value of the overlap between one and two. Okay, so this is the unambiguous discrimination. Any question on this part, this particular case? Okay, I hope that the explanation is clear enough. And also the physical intuition is this picture. You find something orthogonal to Day one, you want to detect if this did, this outcome appear, it must come from side two. Okay. In contrast to the previous case, 
the minimum error, the minimum error, the physical intuition is really, you find a orthogonal basis that has the, the best overlap uh, for respective uh, basis state. So I want V1 as close to Psi1, V2 as close to Psi2, okay. Okay, so that's the state discrimination. And these are related to uh, non-orthogonal state, no cloning, etc. Okay, so the, these are the simplest case cases. We could generalize, but I won't do that. But I just want to point you to some literature. So you can consider unequal probability. Right? I already pointed out the Hellstrom bound, or already consider an unequal probability. You could also consider more than two. It turns out that there are not um, general analytic solutions. So even for three pure states, and it's not, not necessarily easy. You could also generate to mixed states. So um, I list two references. This uh, the first one is the older one, and this is a. Um, a more recent one was a discussion on application. Okay. Any question? Okay. If not, uh, I'm going to turn to a slightly different subject, but it's also related. So the no cloning and no perfect discrimination on orthogonal state turns out to be useful and useful in the in the context of secure communication. Okay. So, so what about secure communication? If we look at the classical case, uh, there, there's a very easy way to make your communication secure is that you have share randomness or share random uh, key. So for example, I want to send this message. So maybe this was a binary representation, representation of a sentence or something or a password, something like that. If I have, so let's just introduce the, the two player, Alice and Bob. If they have shared a secret key, in this case is this this string one, one, zero, et cetera. What they could do is they do the XOR. So you get this in, uh, you turn this message into an encoded one, okay? And then you just send this publicly. You can even public announce this uh, because uh, any person who have this copy does not know the secret key they cannot actually decipher what the intended message was, okay? But Bob can decrypt the message by using the share secret key and do the XOR again, then can recover the, the messages, okay? So recover message. Okay, this is proven secure as long as you don't recycle your, your secret key. So if you do this many times using the same secret key, then it's likely that I, uh, that secret key could be inferred and the message could be decoded. Okay, so this, is, this idea was proposed a long time ago by Vernon. Okay, so that's one way to make your communication secure. The other, this is called secret key. So the first one is secret key. Okay, and as opposed to the secret key, there's another way which is uh, used uh, in our everyday life. This is the public key cryptography. So for example, this RSA invented by these three people is used uh, in, in all, almost all the communication, including the internet security, okay? But as opposed to the this one-time path, 
this RSA or public key cryptography rely on some difficulty of solving certain problems. For, for example, the RSA rely on factoring large integer is a difficult problem. Okay. Yeah, and you probably have seen the RSA challenge. They publish a long number for you to factorize. Okay, so in this public key scenario, there is a public key and also a private key. And you, for example, if Bob want to uh, communicate, uh, he can publish the public key. So anyone uh, want to communicate uh, securely with Bob can encrypt message using the public key uh, because the secret key is supposed to be difficult to, to break. Uh, then it, they can use an encrypt message and then Bob decrypt by applying the, his secret key. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Um, in more detail, uh, Okay, but before that, um, this RSA unfortunately could be broken by Schultz factoring algorithm. So yeah, so this is the RSA public key, but I don't want to go into detail. This is uh, used in, in, in the, for example, SSH uh, protocol and many others. Basically it, it rely on fact factorize a large number and uh, could factor into two factors, prime number, P and Q, et cetera. And from there, you could, you could uh, choose a, a key. This, this is a secret key and then the corresponding public key. But I list the procedure here. Uh, for those who are interested, you can, you can go through this yourself how you encrypt, how you decrypt. Uh, you use modular, so modular, so modular are some number, yeah. So I gave you some example, n equal to 15, and some example of secret key and uh, public key. So, but, uh, but this is not, this is not uh, the essential point. I just want to mention that, that this is how it, it is used. But what we want uh, to see if that the no, no cloning could could help or not. So even though uh, if you have a quantum computer, you can break the RSA, but you could also use a quantum communication, which uh, is probably secure. So the idea, of course, is these are our familiar player, Alice and Bob. Uh, if there's an east trapper uh, in the middle, uh, you want to communicate with Bob. Uh, the idea of this so-called public key to uh, QKD quantum key distribution is that Alice and Bob try to use quantum state. Um, and I want to say non-orthogonal example, a non-orthogonal state to establish secret key. So it may seem uh, weird that how can you use a uh, quantum state to publicly send to public channel and you can establish secret key. Okay, this uh, was the contribution of these three people. Um, Bennett and Brazar, they propose something called BB84, which I'm going to discuss uh, by sending now orthogonal state. And then later Ecker uh, found out that you could use entanglement and uh, actually bail inequality that we learned early in, in the course, okay? But just a three bullet summary of this is the quantum state 
cannot be cloned. Therefore, there is some hindrance, something that could be hidden. Okay. Uh, and if somebody sort of tamper with the, the state, the quantum state, for, for example, perform some measurement, then the state will be disturbed. So the measurement disturbs the state and they can check whether there's a disturbance. And then that you could also use an entangled version of that. Okay, so that this is the overall idea, overall picture. But let me go into the detail of the BB84 quantum key distribution. So yeah, remember the goal is to establish a random sequence, random classical one. This is classical bit. Between Alice and Bob. And you want to use a non-orthogonal state. So naively, uh, I'm considering using light. So we discussed the horizontal and vertically polarized light and also the rotative diagonal, anti-diagonal ones, for example. These are in, in the languages is zero, one and plus and minus, okay? So what they could do is if they want to send zero, they could either send the horizontally polarized line H or the diagonal polarized line. Uh, if they want to send one, they could send the vertically polarized line or the anti-diagonal polarized line. Okay, so there are sort of two sets of zero and one and they are not orthogonal. Okay, so that's the non-orthogonal feature that's going to be used. Okay, so in more detail, uh, let's say uh, Alice uh, want to send this random sequence, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, et cetera. For each bit, for example, 0 here, she randomly select which basis. So there are two bases. So for example, she may select a uh, HV basis, uh, the corresponding zero will be represented by a H here. The next one is one. Uh, she select HV basis as well. So this is V encoded by the V state. For the third one, she happened to choose uh, the DA basis and encode that with D, etc. Okay. So she sent these quantum states just publicly through public channel to Bob. So Bob on his end would try to measure, right? Remember there are two different bases. Alice and Bob have no way of which basis that wants you to send on the other side or the basis that Bob try to measure. So uh, as illustrated here, so for each bit or each quantum bit, Bob receive, he will randomly select a basis, either the HV basis or DA basis. So those that mark with red are those that Bob happened to measure in the same, uh, same basis as the basis that Alice encode. Okay, so for so example, yeah. If Bob choose to measure in the HV basis, that coincide with the basis of Alice. So they would have perfect correlation, right? So Bob will certainly know this is H. Okay, but before they compare the basis, uh, they don't know, but Bob records the H here. For the second bit, uh, qubit, Alice sent V, but Bob chose the wrong basis. He got D, so he just keep uh, a record of what the basis he used and the measurement outcome, okay? So, so far they don't know which, which basis uh, they use. So once Bob complete his measurement on all the qubits, then they publicly compare. So then Alice and Bob uh, compare Okay, I'm using the first one, I'm using the HV basis, yeah, and the second one using the, uh, Alice says, I'm using 
also HV basis and Bao said, oh, I'm using a DA basis. Then he simply threw away that. They, they knew this is not useful and also this is not useful. Only when the basis are the same that they, they could have a perfect correlation, right? Okay, so these are marked in red. So on average, they have to throw away half of the, the qubit and measurement outcome. So, but when they know they are using the same basis, they could establish a uh, random key, right? In this case, uh, on this sub set, I have a subset 0, 1, 0, random key that they establish, okay? So that's the idea of key distribution using now orthogonal states. If you could ask, okay, why is this secure? So, and furthermore, they could actually make this more secure, but let me try to answer the question. Why is it secure by introducing the eavesdropper uh, and the eavesdropper would try to intercept, intercept these, uh, these photons. So that, that's the scenario that previously I showed. Like, so as above, and there's, there's a, these HV, D, A, et cetera. So E has many way to attack this. So the mo most straightforward thing is E, uh, capture the qubit, intercept the photons from Alice, and also randomly perform the measurement. Right? A also mimicking Bob. Okay, H and B basis or D A basis. Okay, and she simply sent the measured outcome, uh, producing a new photons in this using the the measurement outcome. For, for example, if she measure in this basis and obtain H, then she just send the H photon to Bob. Okay. Okay. So the idea is that um, when Alice Bob happened to use the same basis, so Alice using the same basis for encoding, but use the same ba basis for decoding. If Eve used the correct basis, okay, then Eve will be able to uh, extract the key, right? So, so but this happens 50%. So in this 50%, no error is introduced, but she has no way to know which basis. So if she performs this intercept and resend, she must also has 50% of measuring in the wrong basis. So then in that, case, uh, she and Bob would have random measurement outcome. So meaning the Bob's outcome would not be correlated with Alice. So even, even if Alice and Bob measure in the same basis, because that is already perturbed by Eve, so Bob would not get the same uh, zero one as Alice has sent, okay? So in this case, because Alice and Bob uh, implementing the QKD was if intercept and resend, the uh, overall error rate that Eve introduced would be 25%, okay? So Alice and Bob could, uh, once they have uh, established keys, they could choose a subset and compare to see the error rate, right? If they see the error rate is 25%, then they know that somebody is intercepting, is eavesdropping, and we should not use the data because that's not secure. Okay, but if the error is low, is low enough, that means Maybe uh, it could be just environment error, or it could be somebody listens uh, from time to time, but not not every qubit. So that means a measure part of the qubit or the measurement are correlated uh, could still be useful. Okay. 
So this means that um, in the perfect scenario, nobody is listening and they get perfect key, correlated key. If somebody is listening, they could infer by comparing the outcome to infer an error rate. Okay, if the error rate is too high, they could just abort and do the key exchange uh, some later time and, and keep those when the error rate is low. Okay, so, so of course I did not explain the regressive proof that the security, um, there are references that you could see how, how the security was proved, uh, but I, I could maybe refer to uh, New Central for some security proof and also references in, in that. So in, an important advantage of this QKD is that uh, once the QKD session, in meaning that once Bob has measured everything, there's no classical transcript. Uh, there's nothing that E can copy, right? So this compared to the classical case, Eve can always uh, copy the encrypted messages and wait until maybe the, the key uh, is broken and you can decrypt messages. So the key K, QKD is secure. Uh, it's always, I mean, in, in a sense, the security is lasts forever. Uh, but the public key, the security has uh, some limited of lifespan until it is broken, okay? Yeah, so yeah, so there were actually some application of QKD and actually QKD system has been manufactured and sold by a few companies. And these mostly were sold to bank, banks and some government, uh, uh, government units. And it was interesting also to, to know that uh, the QKD was implemented in, in one uh, Swiss elections. Uh, I'm sure it's probably not implementing in this current uh, US election. It was also in the World Cup. Okay. Yeah, so there's also, so there's also other way to make the the key that they established from the world measurement to be more secure. So they could, for example, uh, try to use certain classical method to make the, the key, their key uh, has less information or mutual information with, with Bob. Okay, so these are the two steps are, the first one is called information conciliation basically using some error correction. Uh, so for example, they have some key, right? Okay, let me just arrange this randomly. So this may be the Alice key and Bob. Uh, in the perfect scenario, it should be correlated, but let's suppose there is something wrong because E might be listening or the environment is noisy. Okay, these are marked in both phase. So what they could do is they could maybe do some parity. They could just compute the parity. This is zero in this case. Uh, this is zero in this case. Uh, parity is zero. Okay, and parity is one. So they might be able to detect some of the error using some parity check, okay? Uh, so they could properly compare the parity. And they could also do something called privacy amplifications uh, that require using some hash functions. So I don't want to talk uh, into the details, but it's really just finding some hash function that map from the original key to some reduced key. 
So the, the n bit string would be mapped to a, a smaller k bit string. And uh, in doing so, because this is uh, this hash function is randomly chosen, um, the probability that the same uh, are small. And in doing so, you can show that the information, so Alice and Bob, and also Eve, the information, how they are correlated is defined as the so-called mutual information. Their mutual information will be, can be reduced arbitrary small. Okay, but these are classical techniques, so I don't want to dwell too much. So I label this as sort of events or further reading subject. But I think the key idea I want to uh, convey is really just this part using non orthogonal state. So, non orthogonal basis for encoding and the measurements random, and they can establish perfect key uh, if there's no disturbance. If there's a disturbance, then they can sacrifice part of their keys and compare. They can uh, calculate, estimate the error rate. And from the error rate, they could de decide whether they want to keep that and to do these uh, information reconciliation or privacy amplification to distill a smaller number of bits, but more secure. Mm. Or they want to abort and do the key distribution again. Any question? So we still have each bit of key for each bit of information we pass. Okay, so if Alice sent n qubit, yeah. right, total n qubit, on average, only half of the qubit are useful, half a bit that they establish are useful, okay? So in the perfect scenario, half of bits can be used, but you would also use part of them to check, check the security to see if, uh, to estimate the error rate, right? As I said, if, Eve is constantly listening, then there will be a 25% error rate. So they could compare from a fraction of their key to compare publicly. And if they find that uh, the error rate is high enough, I forget the exact number, maybe 13 or I, I forget the exact number. If the error rate is higher than a certain number, then they decided they should not use those keys. But if it's low enough, then they proceed to do these classical method. Okay. Does that answer your question? So, so the the ray of secure key uh, would be less than one one half and could be lower. Okay. So I mentioned these using the non-orthogonal state. But it turns out uh, with shear entanglement or a source, maybe let me just say a source sending entangle photon to Alice and Bob. I mean, entangle photon uh, and source need not be secure or need not be honest. You could also use uh, entanglement. So this is different from the previous case because they have a uh, shear entanglement. So it turns out you could also use entanglement to do the key distribution, okay? And it's related to violation of Bell inequality that we learned uh, some time ago, okay? So, so the idea is as follows. So suppose just for uh, the ease of analysis, assuming the source is emitting Bell state, but they might emit other states, okay? But if they are honest, 
if the source is unless the, the source would distribute a fail state like this but the source could distribute any 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 state they want but we know the bell inequality right so quantum mechanics violate this violate so there's a b remember this two square root two versus two for classical as a maximal violation and we remember those axes that Alice and Bob need to choose is Alice choose two outcome two two different axes. So it's listed here in the bold case. Uh, zero angle here, pi over two angle here on Alice side. Uh, on Bob side, he would choose a pi over four and three pi over four. So you have seen this in your homework as well. So the idea is they want to have these axes stiffer by pi over four angle or minus pi over four or or uh, three pi over four, something like that. So that you get a uh, square root two from the cosine plus minus one over square root two. That's why you get this. So remember they are choosing A1, B1, A2, B2, A1, B2, A2, B1 with another minus with a minus sign for one of the combination okay yeah so this is for the two axes so meaning that if um, Alice side should perform measurement randomly chosen from the two axes and Bob randomly chosen from these two axes they can compare the violation of bare inequality to see how big uh, bigger than two this b is the bigger the b the more secure that they could establish right so they could be more confident that this is uh, really close to uh, the single state or not right so now here comes the connection for the secret key is that they introduce uh, a third axis let me just say here introduce a third axis for measurement. Okay. Why would they want to do this? Because introducing this in this particular angle for the third axis, uh, phi three on the A part align with phi one at the B, right? Therefore, the measurement outcome, if they compare publicly, if they if they are using the same axis, the outcome are anti-correlated, right? So if they align, so if this A and B, you will get anti-correlation. In fact, using any parallel axis, they get uh, anti-correlated outcome because this is a single state anti-symmetric state, right? So there is a pair of these. There's also a second pair of the, uh, the vertical one. Okay, so they, they, they would uh, be able to establish a perfect, in this case, anti-correlation, and therefore they can get the common secret key, right? So what they, what they would do is they measure uh, randomly in any of the three bases, like right, as shown here. And once they have their measurement outcome, they probably compare the, uh, the result, right? And if the axes are from these two and these two, they use that to check bare inequality. So for these, And these. So if let's say if they if A measure this and B measure in this axis or any of the four combination, like they, then they use the result to check bell inequality. If not, 
they choose this and this for key distribution. Okay. So yeah, so meaning that uh, they could check security and uh, stepping the key uh, in all together, right? Okay. So this this was proposed by Hacker, and this has been demonstrated. Um, question on this. I think this is probably one of the most deep uh, application that I, I've seen using really fundamental, right? So really fundamental idea of bell inequality can be used to do uh, applications. So this is a, a most surprising uh, link between foundation of quantum mechanics and the application, useful application. Okay. Okay, we have about 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do in the remaining is to sw switch gears. I'm going to talk about some tomographic tools for quantum computers or quantum operations. So, so we see, for example, uh, if you have a quantum computer, so you quantum computer, you will start with some state preparation. and then gate operation. And then you have at the end measurement, right? And because the error is probably the most uh, dangerous thing for quantum computing, you want to make sure all the three stages are done correctly. So how do we do that? There are some tools, they are not perfect, but at least computationally they are useful. For state preparation, you could do something called state tomography, quantum state tomography to, to see if you prefer the state uh, perfectly or of high fidelity. For gate operation, there's something called uh, process to quantum process tomography to see if gate is performed close to what you want. And lastly, uh, if you perform measurement for the readout, you, there's something called detector tomography that can verify that the, your measurement is doing what you really want or not. Okay, so I'm going to just introduce these three different tomographic tools. Uh, of course, there are others, but these are the most basic ones. Uh, yeah, so I want to stress, mostly people discuss these two. Uh, recently, there are more discussions on uh, the measurement. Okay. So let me first uh, discuss the quantum state tomography uh, in a more general case, not just preferring zero in, for a quantum computer. Suppose you have a state row, somebody prepare a state row, but they prepare many copies. And they want to you to estimate what what exactly is this state, okay? So the unknown state. Uh, how do I uh, do that through measurement? So let's consider one qubit case. So remember, I hope you by now you remember that a single qubit state is uh, written conveniently in in the poly basis, right? So there's a vector r. It's in the blocks up here. Okay. And uh, if I can perform measurement and estimate these R, X, R, Y, R, Z, then I can infer what row is, right? So to do that, it turns out to be simple by just looking at these formulas. So the R, X mathematically is a trace between rho times sigma x, okay? And what that means is that, I mean, okay, first you can verify this here, just verifying that. Uh, but the consequence is that the sigma x is 
interpret as a measurement in the plus and minus basis, right? With the minus sign is due to the, the negative eigenvalues. So that means if I can measure in plus minus basis, I infer Rx. And similarly, if I can measure in the plus minus i basis, so they can infer the Ry. So basically these are, namely the, the estimation along the three axes, uh, x, y, and z, right? Rz is really the, the commutational basis. The difference between the probability getting zero and getting one, okay? Okay, so you need to have many copies in order to get uh, a property distribution, okay? So this means that if I can uh, switch between three measurement bases, then I can determine a one single qubit state, okay? Okay. Yeah, okay, I'll reset these. You could generate these to multiple qubit. So for example, two qubit, what you want to expand in terms of, in terms of the poly, product of poly. Yeah, then you have, for example, uh, this coefficient r mu nu is the two qubit state times the sigma corresponding poly product of poly matrices and the trace. So these are this can be obtained by by measuring in corresponding basis. So for example, sigma x and sigma y. Right, so qubit one, qubit two, they measure in different bases. In this case, they can infer the R, X, Y, okay? And that can be generated to more qubit. Question on this? Okay, so it, it's, yeah, it's really simple. So the next one, is slightly more complicated is I want to estimate not the state, but a process, a process represented by a black box. And you are allowed to send in any state. So I send in row in and I get row prime and I can perform the state tomography on row prime. Right. So basically by doing this, I can infer that I know the input row and I would know output row prime by, by state tomography. Okay. And how do I uh, actually achieve uh, a complete characterization of the process? Uh, in general, it's not possible, but you could limit yourself to the, uh, the certain degree of freedom. If it's infinite degree of freedom, then it's very complicated. Suppose I'm only care about the effect on a qubit. So maybe uh, there is a bug here that's affecting my operation. So you want to debug this. So, and yeah. So the assumption is you can send in whatever you, you want and measure the state tomography. And you want to infer what the black box. So there are really three different ways to do that. But I, I think for the time, I can maybe talk about the simplest case. So the idea, for example, if you want to measure the qubit, right? So row, you can write as row 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. If I know how row ij is transformed into row i, how row ij is transformed, 
So indicating by this, so JK element, how does it transform? If I know that, then by linear superposition or just uh, mixing these, then I know the transformation of general state, right? General state. General state can be written as rho jk sum over j. Yeah, so the idea is really simple. If I know how each component transform and there's only finite number of components, then I could just by summing these up, I know what arbitrary state. So the coefficient, there are many uh, infinite way of writing the coefficient, but as long as I know how the basis is transformed under the black box, then I can infer uh, for arbitrary input what is uh, the effect of this uh, black box is doing. Okay, so that's the idea. So meaning that how do I construct a complete basis for this matrix? So for example, I have zero, zero that would cover this one. One, one cover this one. So that's just the sending zero and measuring zero one basis. And I, I cover these. And what about the off diagonal element? So the off diagonal element, you can verify that it can, actually can be decomposed into the, uh, the mixture of the plus plus i i zero zero and one one with coefficient i and one plus i etc. But the upshot is that you can measure how plus plus is transformed plus i zero these four states how they transform then you know the zero one how zero one get transformed right and similarly for the one zero okay. So that's the idea. So this is called process tomography. The standard one is to send in, for example, these four states repeatedly and then measuring their output. By mixing the component, you can predict arbitrary state. So this is called standard quantum process tomography. Okay, any question on this? So maybe next time I would uh, reviewing this again, and then uh, complete the discussion on the process tomography. Let me stop here to see if you have questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, then that's end today's lecture here and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks.